Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the live stream tonight from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame right here in Cleveland, Ohio. My name is Jason Hanley, and I'm the Vice President of Education and Visitor Engagement here at the museum. And we're so uh, grateful that you were all able to join us this evening for our collaboration lecture series with the American Musicological Society. Uh, we've been doing this for over 10 years now, and I've had a great history of some fantastic lectures and conversations on rock and roll and popular music and uh, looking at really some of these great scholars who are doing fantastic work in the field and presenting these lectures so that all of us can get to learn a little bit more about the great research that's been being done on rock and roll. Many of them who have done some research here at the Library and Archives at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I just want to start out by thanking the American Musicological Society. It's great to be doing this partnership and continuing these programs. And um, we have got a lot going on here, I have to say, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In fact, right downstairs, right now, uh, they are working on a brand new exhibit that will open uh, this weekend, on Friday, in fact, called Get Back to Let It Be, which is an exhibit based around the fantastic film, the Get Back film that Peter Jackson took hours and hours of footage from the Beatles, originally recorded around the Let It Be project, and actually turned it into a six plus hour uh, miniseries in a, in a way uh, on Disney Plus. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a long film, but the detail and seeing the Beatles actually in the creation of what was supposed to be a multimedia project at the time and turned into the Let It Be album is just a fascinating thing to do. Here at the Rock and Hall of Fame throughout the summer, you'll be able to come and check out that exhibit that brings that film and the album to life. Um, artifacts that relate directly to things you saw in there, handwritten lyrics from the Let It Be album, some of the uh, you know outfits that you see them wearing, the instruments that they're playing, as well as a unique cut of much of that footage for here in the museum. So check that out, it opens this Friday. Also, I should mention, we have our 2022 nominees out there right now for our next induction class. Uh, some great, great artists. I know right now at the top of the fan vote, artists like Eminem and Duran Duran, uh, but some incredible artists here on the list this year. Everybody from the New York Dolls and Tribe Called Quest to the Arrhythmics and Pat Benatar and Beck and Devo. The fan vote is open right now. Go to rockhall.com and you can place your vote. Uh, for the top five artists you would like to see inducted. Stay tuned to rockhole.com because this spring we will announce the inductees, who from that great class uh, of nominees is going to actually get inducted. And then the induction ceremony will be held later in the fall. So you can look at, on rockhole.com for more information about that and to get tickets to the actual induction show, which is fantastic. So, um, tonight, we're really proud to be hosting a lecture uh, and interview uh, on a fan fantastic topic, Recovering Early Asian American Voices in American Popular Music to Girl Groups. Uh, it's really great that we're going to be able to have this. A good friend of mine, Eric Hung, is going to be one of the presenters, along with Leslie Lee. And again, like I said, this is a fantastic collaboration with the American Musicological Society. So to get us kicked off here and help give an official welcome from our partner, uh, I'd like to introduce Steve Swain, who is the uh, Jacob H. Strauss 1922 Professor of Music at Dartmouth and is also the current president of the American Musicological Society. Steve, welcome. Great to have you with us here tonight. Thank you so much, Jason, and, and thank you all for joining us tonight. On behalf of the American Musicological Society, I welcome you to tonight's AM, AMS Rock Hall Lecture. I'm grateful that you all are here. The AMS values our collaboration with the Rock Hall as an important way to share the history of rock and roll and to expand that history by telling new stories and opening our ears to many styles of music. Tonight, we will be hearing some stories that will be new to most, if not all of us, old though the stories are in rock and roll years. Before we turn to those stories, I would like to take this opportunity to recommend to you a web page on Musicology Now, the AMS's online platform for sounds, words, and ideas. The page is titled Music from Ukraine, and there are several posts there from artists who make classical, folk, jazz, and pop music. I would invite you to disseminate the link to your colleagues who might know of Ukrainian rock and roll artists 
who would welcome being highlighted and spotlighted there. There's a link at the bottom of the Musicology Now page that invites participants to join in this collective host. Tonight, we have a collective, a collective presentation by two members of our music research community. Leslie Lee and Eric Hung will discuss the many histories and absences of, Amer of Asian Americans in American popular music, despite their presence in the early histories of vaudeville, jazz, reggae, and many other styles. In doing so, they will remind us that there has long been cultural interchange beyond the white-black binary in American popular music, something that is more than evident today as Asian Americans flourish in all major genres of American popular music. Leslie Lee is the author of four books and the producer-director of The Kim Lu Sisters, a feature-length documentary currently in post-production about a Chinese-American jazz vocal quartet popular in the 1930s and 40s who became the first Asian-American act to star in a Broadway musical, or in Broadway musical reviews. Leslie has been awarded grants from the New York State Council for the Arts, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, Chinese Heritage Foundation, and the Freeman Foundation. Eric Hung is executive director of the Music of Asian American Research Center, the curator of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Learning Pathway for Smithsonian Folkways, and adjunct lecturer at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies. Eric holds a PhD in musicology from Stanford University and an MLIS in archives and digital curation from the University of Maryland. Eric and Leslie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, yeah. Jason. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here tonight. And I'll remind everybody too, uh, as Steve and I part ways with the uh, program. Don't forget, I'll be back at the end for a Q&A with Eric and Leslie. You can post any questions you have in the chat right down there on YouTube, and we'll be taking some of those at the end of the program. So take it away, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good evening. Leslie Lee and I would like to thank the Rock Hall, particularly our moderator, Jason Henley, Lindsay Bamba, who we have been corresponding with, uh, John Gurky, who is our producer tonight, uh, as well as Steve Swain and the American Musicological Society for making this talk possible. Uh, it is a great honor for us to be able to talk about pioneering Asian American artists at the Rock Hall. And we should note, and next slide, please. Yeah, next one, please. Thank you. We should note that we're giving this talk on the first anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings that killed eight people, including six women of Asian descent. These heinous murders grabbed the nation's attention for a few weeks, but it is important to recognize that this COVID-19 spark wave of anti-Asian violence has yet to wane. In the New York City area over the past couple of months, Michelle Goh died after she was pushed onto the subway tracks. Christina Luna Lee was stabbed over 40 times and killed by someone who followed her into her apartment. A man assaulted seven Asians in one day, and another man hit an Asian woman at least 125 times in the lobby of a Yonkers apartment complex. It is no wonder that many Asian women continue to worry about their safety every time they leave their home. It is our contention that the erasure of Asian Americans by historians and cultural heritage workers is a key reason why Asian Americans are often seen as perpetual foreigners. After our presentation, we hope that you will agree that talking about artists like the Kim Lu sisters and the Kim sisters is an important endeavor that can help Asian Americans gain a fuller sense of belonging. It can also lead to a more complex and accurate histories of American popular music and more generally of the United States. Next slide, please. In mainstream accounts of American popular music of the early and mid 20th century, Asian Americans are conspicuous by their absence. In many textbooks, 
The earliest Asian Americans to appear by name are Alex and Eddie Van Halen, whose mother was Indonesian. You can see a picture of them as children on the left. And among Rock Hall inductees, the only earlier Asian American that I know of is Duke uh, Fakir, the lone surviving member of the Four Tops, whose father was from what is now Bangladesh. Ronnie Spector's great-grandfather was, I believe, Chinese, but to my knowledge, she did not identify as Asian. Next slide, please. Yet, as Steve pointed out earlier in his introduction, Asian Americans have been present and important in the early history of most genres of American popular music in three different ways. First, several performed on iconic stages across the country. For example, a good, uh, a good number of Asian Americans were stars on the vaudeville stage. The most famous of these is uh, Lee Tong Fu or Frank Lee. Born in 1875 in Watsonville, California, he toured the vaudeville circuit from 1905 to 1918. He often started his act by performing racist stereotypes of Chinese people. You can see the middle of the screen. Uh, this is him in Chinese traditional clothing. And then he broke into American popular song like opera or a comic patter. This is a strategy that both the Kim Lu sisters and especially the Kim sisters used in their performances. So this is a long lasting tradition of starting with the stereotype and then breaking it. To show the artificiality of stereotypes, Lee also performed in kilts and mocked Scottish caricatures. You can see him in a so-called Scottish costume on the right. After he got married in 1918, he settled in New York City and ran two restaurants while taking some minor roles on Broadway. He launched his film career at the age of 57. I'm not sure how many people can say that, that they started a film <laughs> career at the age of 57. Shortly afterwards, he moved to Los Angeles and appeared in minor roles, unfortunately mostly in stereotypical roles in over 50 films. He died in 1966 at the age of 91. Other Asian Americans who performed on major stages across the United States in the early to mid 20th century include Willie Mae Wong, an original member of the International Sweethearts of Jazz, singers Pat Suzuki and Ethel Azama, and the Filipino band that accompanied mandolin virtuoso Dave Apollon from the late 1920s through the 1930s. Next slide, please. Second, Asian Americans of the early and mid 20th century performed American popular music within their own communities for a variety of reasons. Here, the most famous examples are big bands at Japanese American incarceration camps during World War II. Unfairly and illegally incarcerated by the US government because they were seen as unassimilable, members of these bands used swing to show just how American they actually were. Another example is nightclubs in various Chinatowns, often collectively referred to as the Chop Suey Circuit. And you can see the, uh, the cover, of the DVD cover of the film Forbidden City USA, which is very much about this circuit. These venues provided performance opportunities as well as hangouts for many second and third generation Asian Americans. They also served as major tourist attractions and quote unquote safe spaces for non-Asians in Chinatowns. I also need to mention taxi dance halls, places where men can purchase tickets to dance with women. Chinese and Filipino American communities in the early 20th century were largely bachelor societies. And given that miscegenation laws existed in many states, these taxi dance halls provided many Asian Americans their only opportunities to interact with someone of the opposite sex. They also employed many Asian American musicians the father of jazz saxophonist Gabe Balthasar Jr., for example, Gabe Balthasar Sr., supported his family by playing in taxi dance halls in Los Angeles and Hawaii. Next slide, please. Third, even when Asian American bodies were absent, the idea of Asianness was frequently present in American popular music of the early and mid 20th century through the performance of stereotypes. These included the use of accents, offensive slangs, and makeup to approximate Asian facial features. More importantly, it involved the construction of archetypes that support the idea that Asians can never be real Americans. 
on screen, you can see three songs that help to build and reinforce these stereotypes. I, I chose three of the less offensive covers. I did not feel the need to, to show some of the really offensive ones uh, in this presentation. But there are hundreds of these, uh, probably thousands. But, um, but you get the idea. I will not analyze them here. But if you want to look further, they, can, uh, they are easily located on the internet. Through, dehumani through dehumanizing Asian and Asian Americans, these works contributed to violence against and legislations that harmed our communities. Unfortunately, many of the stereotypes advanced in these songs continue to appear in popular culture today, and they have played significant roles in the current wave of anti-Asian violence, particularly acts against women. Next slide, please. In this presentation, Leslie and I ask, what would happen if Asian Americans were a part of the standard narrative of American popular music? The inspiration for this question came from Afrofuturists and indigenous futurist artists and scholars who insist that if you cannot imagine a liberatory future, you will never be able to make it a reality. So I hope that we can do some imagination tonight. This insight is, I think, particularly pertinent to 1.5 second and third generation Asian Americans. Uh, 1.5 generation means people like me who came as children. Uh, I, I came to, uh, I moved to Canada when I was eight, but generally we refer to people who moved prior, like when they were uh, tweens or under. This is because we are here because our ancestors imagined a future that is different from the one that they were born into. They then tried to make this imagination into reality, even though many knew it might be a very costly to them socially, emotionally, and often financially. It is our task to make sure that their stories are not erased, even if we're often at odds with some of their decisions. We will now set up this space for imagination by introducing the Kim Lu sisters and the Kim sisters. Afterwards, I invite you to help us imagine what effects these stories and a thousand others can have on both Asian Americans and anyone who is interested in American popular music. And you can see the Kim sisters on the left of your screen. The Kim sisters with their mother, uh, with um, the Kim sisters is actually two sisters and a cousin, uh, but the two sisters' mother, who served as their manager, is also in this picture. Next slide, please. The Kim Lu sisters were a jazz vocal quartet and later trio from Minneapolis. Often dubbed the Chinese Andrews sisters, they performed at major venues across North America in the 1930s through the end of World War II. They also made two soundies and appeared in a Hollywood musical comedy entitled Meet Miss Bobby Sox. Sorry, I say, try to say that fast a few times. Meet Miss Bobby Sox. The Kim sisters were a vocal trio consisting of two sisters and a cousin, and they were often called the Korean Andrew sisters. Raised in musical families in what became South Korea, they became as tweens and teenagers entertainers at military clubs of the 8th United States Army in Korea, or USAC, in the 1950s. These clubs played major roles in raising the morale of US soldiers stationed in an extremely unstable country. Based on what he heard from soldiers, producer Tom Ball went to South Korea in 1958 and recruited them for his China Doll Review at the Thunderbird Hotel in Las Vegas. Ultimately, the Kim sisters appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show 22 times, and members of the trio remained headliners in Las Vegas into the 1990s. The two vocal ensembles flourished at different points in Asian American history. Amazingly, the Kim Lu sisters created successful performance careers for themselves at the height of the exclusion era, a time when the United States made legal Asian immigration almost impossible, when Asians were barred from white schools in many states, and when mistrust of Asian Americans led to the incarceration of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. The Kim Lu sisters suffered many instances of explicit racism at several points in their careers and later lives. After performing in Canada, for example, the Kim Lu sisters, who were all born in the United States and therefore had birthright citizenship, 
they took the train back to the United States. The train conductor, not some, not not an official of the U.S. government, the train conductor, refused to let them across the border, and he left them at the last Canadian train station. Ultimately, the Kim Lu sisters retired shortly after the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943, which resulted from the fact that China and the United States were allies in World War II. The Kim Lu sisters spent much of the last couple years of their careers helping the US government change Americans' perceptions of China and people of Chinese descent. As high-level performers of what we now call the Great American Songbook, they demonstrated that Asian Americans were perfectly capable of learning and performing mainstream American culture. Their last major tour was organized by the USO. Over 23 weeks in the Mediterranean theater, they gave 158 concerts and entertained over 120,000 military personnel. Next slide, please. In contrast, the Kim sisters began their careers during the Cold War. Whereas the United States closed borders and often took isolationist stances during the interwar period, the country now saw itself as the leader in containing communism and spreading capitalism and consumerism abroad. This involves getting as many allies as possible around the world, and a key soft power strategy is cultural exchange. It is in this context that the U.S. started the Fulbright program in 1946, jazz tours in 1950s, and the Peace Corps in 1961. The country also welcomed visitors and immigrants that it felt can help to polish the country's image both to itself and abroad. In the South Korean context, the U.S. media of the 1960s and 1970s often presented the transnational adoption of orphans and the subsequent integration of Asian children into mostly white families, white American families, as examples of the country's benevolence. As scholar Yu Jung Lee points out, American media often used a similar narrative to discuss the Kim sisters' American careers. She wrote, quote, with the family as the most available metaphor for U.S.-South Korea relations, the Kim sisters' career path from GI camps to inclusion and adoption on American stages was often portrayed in a way that paralleled the Americanization of Korean orphans and adoptees, end quote. What is also important is that for both transnational adoptees and the Kim sisters, the process of assimilation can never be complete. They can never get rid of their alien bodies and issues of race can never be erased. Next slide, please. Uh, let us now dig a bit deeper into the lives and careers of the Kim Lu sisters. Uh, we will spend a lot more time on the Kim Lu sisters and the Kim sisters today. Uh, this is partially because uh, the Kim Lu sisters is currently the lesser known group uh, since the uh, advent of uh, K-pop coming to the United States and being big in the United States, uh, people have started doing research on the Kim sisters as a precursor to the, to the K-pop craze uh, that really started maybe 10 years ago. And if you're interested in that, I can certainly refer you to articles about that at the end of this presentation. But more importantly, I want to spend more time on the Kim Lu sisters because um, writer and filmmaker Leslie Lee, the daughter of the third Kim Lu sisters, Janae, uh, has agreed to join us today. So thank you, Leslie, for, for coming in. Uh, before I ask, me. sorry, uh, before I ask Leslie any questions, uh, let's play a little bit of music. Uh, this is G the Jeep Jumps. This is a soundy which means it's a short film for a video jukebox and was released in 1944. So John, can you please play video one? The Kim Lu sisters. Bum, 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 call me Susie, Jesus, 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 Jesus,
bomb called the Luigi, the deep down bomb, 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 bomb. it's screwy. Okay, Leslie, um, can you tell us a little bit about this video? And, okay. and John, can you put the slide on as well uh, with the with the still from this uh, with the still from the video? Yep, thanks. Thank you. The um, G the Jeep jumps is the name of the song, and the name of the video was "Jumping in a Jeep." You see the Jeep there. There's an American soldier in the front. And you'll see in the background, it says the road to Chongqing. The, now China was an ally to the United States during World War II. So on the Eastern Front, Chinese, they were fighting the Japanese. The Chinese had been fighting the Japanese since 1937 during the Sino-Japanese War. Then World War II came in and China and Japan were on the East, Eastern Front and um, Italy and Germany were the enemies at that time on the Western Front. What was happening in China was that the Japanese were taking over more and more territory and forcing the Chinese armies farther and farther inland. So they had to leave Nanking, they had to leave um, Beiping, which was not the capital at that time, but Nanking was to Chongqing, way in the, into the interior. And that's why you see that sign, Road to Chongqing. The other soldiers that you will see who are uh, Chinese, Chinese Americans actually, because China was the ally to the United States at that time, they were actually friends of the Kim Lu sisters. They were not soldiers. I think one was a lawyer, one was the owner of a number of Chinese restaurants. And they said, you're making a soundy? We want to be in it. And so that's a bit of the uh, background for that particular soundy. Yeah, thank you. So some, some things never change, right? <laughs> yeah, um, cool. Uh, do you know who wrote the song? This is. I don't. Okay. So I, I do not know who wrote the song. It's probably on one of my um, music sheets, but I don't have it with me right now. But there are a number of songs written during that time. In fact, the Andrews sisters, they also had a, uh, a soundie where they were riding along in a Jeep, dressed also in uh, uniform as the Kimberly sisters are here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think I recently saw one where Doris Day, a very young Doris Day, was in uniform and she was singing about, um, I think, uh, getting married uh, during, the, during World War II. Mm -hmm. So it was something that was apparently fairly popular at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, you told me a really interesting story about your attempt to, to find this video. Uh, do you want to tell that story? To find it? it well, I was having, um, I think you, that you maybe... You were bidding for it. You, you I do. As far as my Auntie Alice... Um, the oh, Alice uh, you were trying to get a hold of this video and you were bidding on it? Oh, that. Oh, Eric, <laughs> yes, no. My, my aunts, uh, they, wanted, um, they wanted that video. They knew that there was G the Jeep Jumps was available. It was actually on uh, eBay. I believe it was on eBay. And so they were trying to get that, the video on eBay. And they said, we've got to stop. We have got to stop bidding for it. There's someone out there who keeps on outbidding us each time we raise the stakes. And when they, they found out finally, there was a musicologist who found out for them and it was the Library of Congress who wanted G the Jeep Jumps because it was considered culturally, historically valuable and they wanted it for the Library of Congress. Yeah. So. I thank you for reminding me. I don't completely forgotten about that. Yeah. So, so how how did you ultimately get a hold of this video? A musicologist. I think that um, my auntie, my auntie Bubbles, he, uh, she went to the musicologist and she said, "Look, 
I want a copy of that. Please, you know, a copy of that for for my son and for myself. And, uh, and the musicologist said, that's fine, Bubbles. I'm going to get you a copy. And she says, no, wait a minute. I've got three sisters. We all want copies. And so we all got copies of G the Jeep Jumps from <laughs> the musicologist. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. For so, um, so that was towards the end of their uh, performance careers. Uh, yeah. After, I mean, after the war, they decided to retire and to get married. Yes. Um, so let, let's go back to the to the beginning. Uh, let's go all the way back, right? Uh, and uh, and talk about how how they came to be. And let's let's maybe start with their father. It's a very mm -hmm. uh, very interesting stories about how uh, the family uh, got together in the first place. So, uh, John, can you put on the next uh, photo? Please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The Kimmy's father was um, Louis Shear Gim, Louis the last name preceding the, the given names usually in, in, uh, in China. He came to this country um, as a paper son, meaning that he had obtained falsified papers claiming that he was the son of an American citizen because at that time the exclusion laws prevented Chinese from entering the United States. It was also something that existed in Canada. So he left at nine years old from Toisan in Southern China and came across the Pacific, landed in Vancouver, where he worked in the fish canneries. Then he moved down to Seattle, where he continued to work in the fish canneries. And then he traveled overland to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he got a job as a dishwasher in the Nanking Cafe, which you see a picture of it here. It was considered the best Chinese restaurant in Minneapolis, and it was a very, very fine restaurant. He worked his way up from dishwasher to waiter to head waiter, and actually the Kim Liu sisters, when they were very young children, they would use the fish pond at the, in the lobby of the Nanking Cafe uh, to present some of their their programs uh, during, for example, Chinese New Year or um, other Chinese celebrations. So, yeah. The, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so they can definitely see it's a very posh restaurant. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Kimi's mother, your, your grandmother, Lena, um, and, and talk about how, how they met? Um, okay. Her homeland is unfortunately very much in the news right now. She was born in Buchak. I don't know how to say that. Ukraine. Buchak, Ukraine. Yeah, uh, which is about 100 miles southeast of Lviv. For those who have been watching the news, you know where Lviv is. Right. Uh, yeah, she was from a place, from a town that is about 100 miles southeast of that. Yeah. Buchach, um, she's um, ethnically Polish, but she was born in Buchach, Ukraine. And I did a little bit of research regarding Buchach. And it turns out that it's extremely, um, it was a trading center, a crossroads for many, many um, ethnicities. For example, I don't want to go too much into it, but I was really amazed because there were many Armenians, many Jews. It turned out to be sort of the westernmost outpost of the Ottoman Empire that actually the Sultan lived in Buchach. Um, for a while. That area in Eastern Europe was, um, the boundaries shifted all the time because over the centuries, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was part of the something called the um, Lithuanian Confederation. So the, it's, it's just an incredible melting pot I think of, of different ethnicities in that particular town. Anyway, Lena was one of 13 children. They lived on an estate. They were farmers, I guess you would say serfs because it was not their land, but they worked as farmers on the estate of a minor aristocracy. Her brothers were bootmakers and musicians. Her sisters were dressmakers. And so the, uh, the Duchess or the Marquise or whoever it was, she had the brothers playing at the balls and the sisters making all the ball gowns for her, <laughs> for the ladies in waiting and for the Duchess herself. So when Lena left at 
12 years old. Um, the fathers started sending the girls first because there were incursions of Russians into Buchach, into that area of, um, formerly it was Poland, now it is Ukraine. And so there was one story that my Auntie Maggie tells about the father with his scythe um, in the fields and Cossacks come riding up and says, and they say, you have to leave here, meaning we want your land and so get out. And the father shakes the scythe at them and says, you'll have to cut off my legs first, meaning you'll have to kill me before, you know, I'm not leaving. So that was, um, that kind of showed me the, the peasant stock from which my grandmother came and uh, the strength of it. All, all the children left. As far as I know, most or all of the children came to the United States and I believe Canada. And one of her sisters preceded her, um, Aunt Lizzie. And my grandmother, Lena, came across, sailed um, across the Atlantic and apparently took the train, I guess, to Minneapolis, Minnesota. How she met her husband, Shirgim, was she was working in a bakery and she got her first paycheck and she was holding it in her hand and she was crossing a bridge in Minneapolis and the wind took it out of her hand and went tumbling across the bridge. Who on the other side of the bridge picks it up but this young Chinese man, Louis Shirgim. That's how they met. Neither of them spoke English. They had just recently come to this country but obviously they learned. In fact, when she arrived at Ellis Island, I think one of the officials that had asked her, um, so you think you're going to do well in this country? You think you're going to be able to learn English? And she said, I speak Russian, I speak Polish, and I speak German, and I'm sure I'll be able to speak English. So mm -hmm. that's how my grandparents met and um, soon had six children, four of whom became the Kimlu sisters, the four eldest. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, I think it's important that uh, you mentioned the skills that she picked up uh, before wh while she was growing up, right? Can you can you tell us why that is so important for the Kim Lu sisters? Oh, you mean Lena? Yeah. Skills? Well, Lena, as far as she, yes, she became, um, she started out um, at home with all those children. She took in uh, sewing for the community and she would stitch ruffles onto um, skirts, uh, five cents a yard for cotton, six cents a yard for silk. And that's how she got pin money. And with that pin money, she was able to send her children to Augie Clausen's dancing school. But I know you've got another um, photograph with that, so I, I'll stop there. But she was also, I think she did everything. I really have to say, that my grandmother not only made all the costumes, the day clothes and the costumes and the gowns for the Kim Lu sisters, but she also was their agent, their chaperone. She designed their costumes and she made the costumes. So mm -hmm. she managed them and, um, no, she wasn't their agent, I'm sorry. She was their manager, but she got them their agents. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, why, why did, uh, she chose to send her daughters to, to dancing lessons? Because um, Auntie, the first child, Alice, was bow-legged. And the mm -hmm. pediatrician said, if you want to have her legs straightened, you should send her to uh, ballet school. Okay. So Alice went to dancing school, to Augie Clausen's dancing school. And he saw that she already, at that very young age, two or three, whatever it was, four, that she had talent. I must also admit that my grandfather, Shirgim, he built the first radio in the neighborhood. So the children, his children, were always listening to the radio, hearing, this, hearing songs being sung and learning English and getting into American culture that way. Mm -hmm. So when she went, when Alice went and Augie Clausen said, are there more at home like you? And she said, yes, I've got lots of brothers and sisters. And he said, well, bring them to school, bring them to this dancing school. And so she did. They all had musical talent. I think it ran in the family from the grand, from Lena's side of the family. And um, he said, okay. He knew they, did, they didn't have money. 
So we said, I'll take them. It'll be four for the price of one. And that's how they started uh, learning how to dance, stretching, acrobatics. And that's how they started. That was the prelude into their career in show business. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. So their first act was called Louis Chinese Review, but before we're, we're going to show uh, a clip from your upcoming film, which is based on oral histories that you did with them. And um, you told me really interesting stories that you grew up didn't not knowing that they yeah. were these performers, right? So yeah. can, can you talk a little bit about that and how you, you did these, uh, eventually found out and did these oral histories? Well, I had written two books about the paternal side of my family, paternal political side of my family. And basically, <laughs> you feel guilty. You know? You're guilty because you're not being um, fair to, let's say, the other side of your family. And you know how family is, Chinese families. <laughs> um, you definitely want to respect both sides. Uh, so I only knew, just kind of peripherally, that my mother and aunts had been in show business. That's all they said. They didn't say that they had been in George White scandals. They didn't say that they had been on Broadway. They didn't say that they had made soundies. They didn't say that they had um, made a feature film. Not at all. I kind of gathered that they must have sung because when we would gather together for family, for Christmas or Easter, they would break into song you know, the four of them together while they're basting the Easter ham or roasting the, the, the Christmas turkey, whatever, they are singing. But so I would look in um, their photo albums and I would see some of their publicity photos. Oh, look at this. Look what you're wearing. What was this? But it wasn't until I really was um, decided, let me, I wanted to write a book about them. But when I discovered there was so much visual and oral material, for example, the Soundies, for example, the uh, the feature film, for example, the publicity photos, the, the programs, the cartoons, all these things about their career that I started realizing, well, this is possible to have a book, to write a book about them, but it really does have to have more oral and visual material because you hear them singing. We also, Auntie Alice had... Um, Reel to reel, it was six, eight millimeter, I forget. She had tape, a tape deck that was almost falling apart with the songs that they sang either in the dressing room or in rehearsal with their, um, their, music, their music person, I forget his name. But uh, so I thought, you this know. I, Leon Carr or? Leon Carr. Yeah. Leon mm -hmm. Carr who wrote Plop Plop Fizz Fizz Oh What a Relief It Is Alka Seltzer. He's done many other things, but that was one thing that I remember. I did not know that. <laughs> you know that. So Leon Carr, yes, their arranger, a music arranger. Um so then I realized, okay, it's got it's gotta be a film. Now I am this is my first and definitely my only film. But I knew that I had to do it because my aunts and my mother were all in their early 90s and their mid to late 80s. And I said, I've got to do this quickly. Um, and so I did it on the fly, really, to get as much material as I could before it would be lost, before they, um, their cognitive abilities were fantastic. So I said, you just have to do it. You've got to catch it fast. Mm -hmm. So and and this frankly, was I want to do a shout out to Harry Karamidis, because without Harry Karamidis, the editor of the Kimberly Sisters film, it would never have gotten to be where it is. It would be, it would be just left and moldering. But Harry saw the little assembly that I put together and said, I want to help you with this. And Harry, thank you so much, because, and because Harry is also the editor of all three installments of the Hollywood trilogy, Back to the Future. So we got a gigantic, gigantic push forward when Harry came on the scene. Harry, wherever you are, in California, you said you'd be watching. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, so so th these interviews were what, 2008, 2009? 2008, 2008. Then Harry came on, I think it was around um, 2008, started in 2007, you know, just gathering material. 
2008. I think I brought it to Harry. He said, okay, 2010. We worked through um, elbow to elbow. And um, I think we had it a basic edit in 2012. And then we kept on working on it, um, just tweaking it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been a long time. Yeah, great, thank you. So John, can you please play video two? I would come out and introduce, oh, yes. uh, and then, ladies and gentlemen, and, gentlemen and, little and little folks too. too. I um, want to introduce to you a Chinese review that was quite up to date. It consists of our mother. You'll see her. Just, Just wait. wait. Six brothers and sisters in one little nest. And so I present the East, east to, to the, the west. west. Here we the are. are. And and we you are. and I <laughs> let the world. Yeah. So <laughs> then we did our I'd, individual acts. acts. I danced with my brother. Then Maggie and Alice danced Tap together. Dance. Tap dance. Then Janae did beautiful love and acrobatic, acrobatic dance. And Niray was too young to do anything, so she would just appear in the finale with my mother to show how many children we were. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, um, it's just... So, uh, just so that uh, our audience knows, can you just go through each of the sisters? Oh, yes. Yeah, so okay. the, the oldest is the oldest is Alice, and mm -hmm. she was the person who helped. Who had, is she was a pack rat. It was through Alice that I got most of the material, the photographs. Mm -hmm. The um, and and who who was she in this video? And Alice was okay. Maggie was at the very Maggie, the second sister was at the very far left. Mm -hmm. Then Alice was the next one. She's the eldest. And then Bubbles was the third from the left. And my mother, Janae, was at the very, very right. So Alice is in pink. Maggie is at the left um, in black. Bubbles is in the black and white sweater. And my mother is at the very far right in, the, in, in black. Mm -hmm. Great. And they were born between 1916, 1916 and 21? 1922, I believe. Okay. Bubbles would never give her exact year. She just said, <laughs> I'm 80 something. You don't have to give my exact age. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. So after touring as Louis Chinese Review for, for a bit, uh, Lena decided to send the two youngest children back to Minneapolis and to right. form a jazz vocal quartet with right. the four oldest children, right? I, I've right. actually never asked you how the younger siblings felt about this. Well, Lowell, the boy, was very glad. He never really wanted to be on stage. He was a boy, you know, after all. And then he's with all five, his five sisters. So he was fine doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. So he went back. Uh, Shergim then took care and raised the two youngest children. Nure was a different story. She wanted, she loved being, she was called the Chinese Shirley Temple. And she already had some of the sawdust in her, in her blood. And she, she went back. She didn't, I think she, you know, did not like being separated from her mother and her sisters. However, she did very well. They sent her, she went to college. She became, um, she went to nursing school and she became a, uh, a head nurse at, um, in California, I think in Los Angeles, where she um, wound up living and uh, marrying and um, having, how many children? Three daughters, three daughters. Mm -hmm. But no, she, she, I think she missed the, um, the excitement and being with her mother and sisters, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as as a quartet, they did a number of uh, appearances at these Chinatown nightclubs, the, the Chop Suey right. Circle, right? Yeah. Um, John, can you put up the next couple of slides? We have a couple of photos of of some of their the advertising posters. Uh, right. Is there anything you want to say about this one? Chinese Follies, there were not many Chinese reviews, but those that there were often had the Kim Lu sisters um, in them. Chinese Follies was one. I think as far as um, another, it was Toy and Wing, the dance team, and they became Can you very- go to the next slide, please, John? We have a photo of Toy and uh -huh. Wing there. Yeah. Okay, Oriental Theater was another Chinese review. And in that, the pink uh, document there, 
at the right, you'll see um, a woman, a man and a woman, the toy and wing, they became a very, very famous uh, tap dance, dance uh, duet duo. They were called the Chinese Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. <laughs> and they broke out of the chop suey circuit as did the Kimlu sisters. They actually went to London, performed at the Olympia Theater. They did very well, very well. Yeah. And, um, and then Bamboo Gardens, I think that was a nightclub in Washington, DC. The Kimlu sisters, Young China on Parade. There were not many, but one thing that did happen in, in one of the Chinese um, reviews is it was very popular in, the in 1936 that um, they sang swing and there was a huge, a gigantic uh, a dance craze called the Big Apple. And the Big Apple uh, kind of combined the Lindy and um, what is that called? You might know the Lindy and... Oh. I, I don't. It's okay. But it was something where it was like trucking and pecking and... Um, it was a dance craze and they danced to the Big Apple. And at the end of the Chinese review that they were in, and very often the Chinese reviews would have authentic Chinese from China and they would be the acrobats or the jugglers. Mm -hmm. And then there would be the new Chinese such as the Kim Lu sisters. And I remember Auntie Bubble saying, and we were the new and we didn't do any of that juggling. We did not do the, the things that the old established traditional Chinese did. We sang jazz, we sang American jazz. But at the end of the review, all the people came out, the authentic Chinese and the new Chinese, and they all danced the Big Apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. So um, the Kimmies got their first Broadway contract in 1939, and it was to perform in George White's Scandals. Uh, and for our audience, this is a review modeled after the Sickfield Follies, and there were 16 different shows over the course of 21 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so let, let's maybe watch it first, uh, watch a clip of uh, the Kimmy's talking about this, the, the hit number first, and then we can, we can talk a little bit more. Uh, so can you play video three, please? You saw us uh, with our uh, knitting boxes, and she said, kids, she says, turn these over. And she said, uh, I have an idea. She said, like Tom Toms. She says, uh, make a sound. We're not drummers, you know. You know, We're and not so, drummers. so we rhythm. said, okay. Pound I mean, she rhythm. says, uh, go da 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 da. And so da 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 da. And so then she, she answered. She go da 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 with her feet. feet. And she says, hey, that's good. And then she, so she says, um, mm -hmm. I try another one, you know. And so it was, mine was da 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 da. <laughs> I remember that. Do you yeah. remember your rhythm? Yeah, da 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 bum. And then she did it. She would do it. And I remember mine. And she would do the same thing. You don't remember, you don't remember yours? No. Oh, you're on the X. <laughs> <laughs> I remember mine. We tried it a few times, and she said, Oh, I'm happy about this. She says, Let's show it to Mr. White. Let's get so, audition it. Huh? Audition, audition it. for it, yes. You know, so that so he said, uh, we have something we'd like to show you. And she said, I'm I, I feel it's something that I want to do. She showed it to him. It's good. Keep it up. He said, We'll we'll see. Add we'll it to we'll the, add it to the uh, yeah, uh, to that uh, to the production to, number. Of the number, yeah. And that was the number that made the show, the show. when we hit Broadway. Opening night, we come on first, the four of us. Yeah, that's right. Curtain opens. We just did a little one. bit. Just a little yeah, bit. Just a little curtains. We open in one. The curtain. We each slip out, two on each side, and we sit there with our with our our, our drums, and then all of a sudden, Annie, Annie comes and she comes out, and then we start you know doing our whatever, and whatever, whatever and she's whatever doing it and everything else. No orchestra, just the drums and Annie and us. And then after several of those things, then all of a sudden, the orchestra comes. Okay, great. Uh, can, can you put up the next slide, please, uh, John? Uh, next one, please. Right, so you can see um, 
a couple of uh, drawings of this. This is um, from from Will Rapport, um, who who is famous for doing sketches for or, or drawings for playbills. I don't I don't do you know where this is from? I'm not sure where it's from. I don't know if it's uh, the New York Times. I know where the other one is from. I don't. But that's mm -hmm. Ben Blue on the left and Miller um, next to him. Um, the singer, I forget her name, but she sang the Mexiconga. And then there are the four Kim Lu sisters. I did want to say that when you saw the Kim Lu sisters talking about their part in uh, the Mexiconga and how they turned over their knitting boxes and beat out a, um, a rhythm that Ann Miller then tap danced to, that Auntie Alice, she was 91 there. Auntie Maggie was two years younger. My mother was two years younger than that. And then Auntie Bubbles was two years younger. So you had 91 years old remembering <laughs> the rhythm that she that she tapped out for Ann Miller to tap dance to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. This is another drawing. This is from the Herald oh, Tribune. Tribune. Yeah, right. it was um, huge. I mean, it really was that they really hit the big time. That Mexiconga became the hit of the show. Ann Miller was then, you know, headed for stardom in um, uh, Hollywood movies. And uh, there was actually in Times Square, there was a gigantic billboard uh, of the, the Mexiconga of George White scandals because it, had, it became so popular that mm -hmm. people actually even, they had to repeat the Mexiconga because the audience kept on clapping. They had no encore. And George White and Ann Miller said, I've got no encore. And George White said, do it again. And she went out and the Kimlu sisters went out with their drums and they did it again. And people would actually um, applaud even before the number came on because they were, they liked it so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll come, come back to issues of cultural appropriation yeah. a little bit later, but um, is there anything else you want to add about about this particular um, about the Mexiconga? Well, I mean, it also besides shooting um, Ann Miller to stardom, it really then it opened the door for the Kim Lu sisters because they were they were so instrumental, <laughs> not mm -hmm. in that partic particular production number that they were then immediately booked into. Um, uh, shows in Philadelphia, New Jersey, Washington, D.C. So the, the scandals really was there. It broke them out of the chop suey circuit. They were now in mainstream American entertainment. Great. So, yeah, so our, I'm just looking at the clock a little bit. Uh, can we just play the next video, which is about their second Broadway contract, uh, How's It Poppin'? Uh, and, and we can go from there. Broadway came calling. This time, it was the Schuberts. Olsen and Johnson had a big, big Broadway show called Hell's a Poppin'. At the end of that stay on Broadway, they wanted it to continue, and they wanted us. And we went on the road for, golly, a, a year. Yeah, Jackie year Gleason was Jackie there. Gleason took over the part. We did a, a lot in Hell's a Poppin'. What songs did we sing? Where, oh. Good night, my love. No, no. Uh, oh, uh, where to? Where? Uh, the man with the patent leather hair. Uh, I mean, these were all songs written, written for, for Hell's, Hell's a Poppin. Poppin. I also did a solo in Hell's a Poppin. <laughs> and not, you know, we don't speak Chinese. We were American born. We we did, you know, we didn't know. You know, Chinese laundries have brown paper with tapes, and that's the way Chinese laundries delivered. My cue was, I don't know what my cue was, but I ran down the aisle, and I would go to the comedian that was on there, and then he would take the laundry, and then I would sing a song called, I Wonder When My Baby's Coming Home. Thank you. So um, maybe we can cl uh, close this um, discussion by playing uh, the other sound that they made, uh, which is take me out to the ball game. John, if you can take that away.
The Kim Lowe system. It's the very same old story. Boy meets girl at first glance, there's romance. She looks into his eyes and softly she sighs. Take me, honey, won't you? Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Okay, so that's the first half of that video. So thank you so much. Uh, Leslie, for sharing you, the story of, of your mother and your aunts with us, and then partially also your story. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, Kim sisters uh, right now. Okay, so during the Kim Lu sisters' performance careers, the Asian population in the United States was small and not growing. According to the 1930 U.S. Census, they were around two, there were around 265,000 people of Asian descent, uh, around 0.2% of the U.S. population. Because of exclusionary immigration laws that Leslie has already talked about, and because of World War II, the number actually decreased to approximately 255,000 uh, in 1940. This changed after the war and particularly in the 1950s. Asian immigration started to increase dramatically, and this trend hasn't really stopped. Uh, in 1960, there were about 980,000 people of Asian descent in the United States. We're now up to 0.5% of the U.S. population. Uh, Ten years later, the number uh, was 1.54 million, or 0.8% of the U.S. population. Because of this growth in the United States' increasing act increasingly active role in global affairs, uh, Asian American performers like the Kim sisters often had diplomatic roles to play. They had to introduce Asian cultures to American audiences and to get them to care about countries with which the U.S. wanted to, uh, to ally or to develop economic relations. They also worked to convince their audiences that the new Asian immigrants were safe and beneficial to the U.S. In Anne Aylin's, um, Anne Aylin's Chang's The Melancholy of Race, she argued that producers of Asian-oriented shows in the early Cold War United States had two main options, quote, to remake the alien body over as much as possible in the image of whiteness, or to accentuate the exotic and make it admirable as such, end quote. In her dissertation, Beautiful Empire, Race, Gender, and Asian Asian American Film, uh, Femme on U.S. Network Television, Daniel Seed insightfully contended that the Kim sisters' success rested on their ability to do both. In their live shows, the trio often began by performing one or more sentimental Korean or other Asian songs, dressed either in Korean hanbok or Chinese cheongsam. As communication scholar Benjamin Han notes, this sometimes involves performing two racist orientalist codes. When they conclude the set, they removed their Asian dresses, thereby revealing their cocktail dresses underneath. And from this point, they perform mostly energetic American songs in a wide variety of styles. For me, these sets depicted a vision of a multicultural nation, one that is consumerist, but also without any political commitment. The Kim sisters sang songs from many different ethnic groups and regions for entertainment, but the sets often mix songs with very different messages. Most notably, a concert might include both minstrel tunes and a spiritual like Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. To give you a taste of the Kim sisters, uh, I will play the beginning of their set on The Ed Sullivan Show on November 20th, 1960. They begin with uh, Ararang, 
uh, a Korean song that the Kim sister must have learned as an anti-Japanese colonialism anthem when they grew up in the 1940s and 1950s. They then removed their hanbok, uh, demonstrating the rapidity at which an immigrant can assimilate, and then launched into a medley of um, songs that were used for minstrel shows, including Swanee and My Mommy. Afterwards, I will play a montage of six clips from other appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show and one recording. Uh, please pay particular attention to their varied vocal production in the different songs. So, uh, John, can you please play the next two videos? <laughs> Sorry, can you play the other one as well? This is the, the wrong order, but that, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. By singing in a variety of American styles while using different vocal production techniques, the Kim sister demonstrated the unassimilable Asian stereotype so prevalent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to be a lie. They showed that these alien bodies can use more nasal sounds for Korean songs, pop soft voices for jazz standards, and more guttural sounds for spirituals. It is, however, 
important to recognize that they need to contend with two other stereotypes that were popular in the exclusion era. One is the lotus flower or the China doll stereotype, which portrays Asian women to be desirable in part because they were subservient. Lacking much agency, they were not fully human and are hence disposable. After all, the Kim sisters originally came to the United States to perform in a China doll review. The other uh, stereotype they have to contend with is a dragon lady, which sees Asian women as potentially threatening and villainous. As performers in family-friendly Las Vegas and television shows, the trio had to be very careful to not appear too sexually available. As Daniel Seeds wrote, quote, the Kim sisters could not overplay their sexuality and risk alienating audiences, even as their sexual appeal remained a vital part of their career success. By and large, television producers specifically targeted white women viewers who skewed older, thus images of beautiful Asian American femmes like the Kim sisters had to appeal within conservative limits, end quote. Put another way, and I'm going to put it in a more blunt way, given the general attitudes towards interracial romance at the time, the Kim sisters could not afford to appear to be too appealing to white men, and thus threatening. Ultimately, the Kim sisters fought these two stereotypes the same way, through learning about the United States' many cultures and honing their crafts. By successfully performing in so many styles and playing over 20 instruments, the trio not only demonstrated their agency, but also made them less threatening. They could not possibly be fooling around with a lot of men out there. They were simply too busy honing their crafts. As the group's oldest member, uh, Su Jia Kim or Su Kim, often stated in interviews, they don't even drink or smoke. This work ethic, of course, inadvertently played into the model minority rhetoric that was gaining steam in the early 1960s. This stereotype, which many continue to believe both within and outside Asian American communities, has unfortunately driven a wedge between different racial minority groups, created problems for less privileged Asian Americans, and led to the rise of mental health issues in our communities. To conclude this talk, we will outline four key reasons why incorporating groups like the Kim Lu sisters and the Kim sisters into the narrative of American popular music is so important to us. And John, can you please put up uh, the final four slides, please? Yeah. Uh, first, as the current wave of anti-Asian violence shows, the perpetual foreigner myth remains alive and well in the United States today. And the question, where are you really from, continues to be asked on a regular basis. This myth is perpetuated in part by the erasure of Asian American history, a process that archivist Michelle Caswell has dubbed symbolic annihilation, that effect, uh, which affects Asian American communities in very specific ways. When musicians claim to have rediscovered Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, or a host of other Black composers, African American communities tend to groan. They groan because these composers' works have never been forgotten and are still used in Black churches on a regular basis. The situation is different for Asian Americans. Because the vast majority of current Asian American families arrived in the US after 1970, and 60% of people with Asian, uh, of Asian descent in the US today were foreign born, few in our communities ever learned older Asian American history from family members. And even fewer learned Asian American history in K-12 education beyond Chinese railroad workers and the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. To put it bluntly, Asian Americans by and large don't know Asian American history. At the Music of Asian America Research Center, we talk regu regularly with young Asian American musicians. And one thing that we keep hearing is that there were no Asian American musicians that they could look up to when they were teenagers or just starting their careers. They had never heard of the Kim Lu sisters. They have never heard of the Kim sisters or even more recent musicians like uh, Nobuko Miyamoto, who is still making records, uh, Hiroshima, or the Mountain Brothers. Incorporating Asian American musicians into the narrative of American popular music will help to fight both the perpetual foreigner myth and to give Asian Americans, especially musicians, a sense that they have roots in this country and that they belong. 
Uh, on screen, you can see uh, two photographs from Andrew Kong's Perpetual Foreigner series. I really like this series. Um, these are Asians doing things that you really think are very American, right? So this is uh, picnicking on the left, right? And then uh, driving a pickup truck or sleeping in a pickup truck, in this case, in fishing boots on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Second, we argue that incorporating the Kim Lu and Kim sisters will help popular music historians tell a more complete and nuanced history. Most popular music and rock textbooks focus on a black-white racial binary, and many do not discuss any Asian, Latinx, or indigenous musicians until we get into the 1960s. For us, this represents an oversimplification. Let us take the example of cultural appropriation, which I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. We do not question the central narrative that white musicians have been appropriating black sounds throughout the history of American popular music. As the examples we discussed this evening show, however, reality was much more complex. Yellow face songs appropriated various Asian cultures. And just as some black performers had to participate in blackface in order to make a living, some Asian musicians composed and performed yellow face songs. In Hells of Poppin, Bubbles had to play the role of a Chinese laundryman, something that she had no, you know, that she had no experience in. Meanwhile, Mexiconga, which was perhaps the biggest hit of the Kim Lu sisters' careers, involved a white dancer and Chinese musicians pretending to be Mexicans. And the Kim sisters sometimes conformed to Orientalist stereotypes, performed minstrelsy songs, and sang spirituals for entertainment purposes. By incorporating music by the racial middle and by indigenous musicians, popular music historians can come up with narratives that are more accurate and inclusive. Uh, next slide, please. Third, through US and European colonialism, American popular music traditions took root in all major cities in Asia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It is important to recognize that this musical influence was not one way. Asian popular musicians came to the United States sometimes because they worked on ships and sometimes to study, to perform for ethnic communities, and to make new careers. Some, like the Kim, Kim sisters and jazz pianist Toshiko Akiyoshi, established major careers in mainstream music industries. It is our hope that popular music scholars pay more attention to how Asian musicians influenced American ones who traveled to and worked in Asia, and how Asian musicians who came to the United States changed the music scenes here. Last slide, please. The final observation is closely connected to the third, and this involves studying the effects of the US military and US militarism had on Asian US musical exchanges. As we laid out in this presentation, both the Kim Lu and Kim sisters worked for the US military in some way. At the end of their performance careers, the Kim Lu sisters performed for the USO and worked to make the China-US alliance more pal palatable to many Americans who held anti-Asian sentiments. Meanwhile, the Kim sisters started their careers as tweens and teens singing for American soldiers stationed in South Korea. On screen, you can see the Kim Lu sisters standing in front of a military plane and the Kim sisters performing at one of these clubs in 1951. These are just two examples of many of the important roles that the U.S. military and U.S. militarism played in the history of American popular music. Cornell professor Christine Balance is currently researching this topic and I look forward to her publications and I hope that popular music scholars will read and build on her work. We also look forward to working with some of you uh, uh, here tonight to create a more complete and nuanced history of American popular music, one that is inclusive of the long history of Asian American voices. Uh, so thank you for joining us this evening, and we're happy to take some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We can't hear you, Jason. There we go. I got it. I was on mute while I was in the green room in the back. Uh, thank you so much. Fantastic presentation. 
uh, really powerful and amazing stories, uh, particularly hearing so much about the Kim Lu sisters and getting to hear, uh, you know, them in their own words uh, talking about the music. I just wanted to uh, read from some of the comments uh, that were online uh, as you were speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, can't wait for the documentary to come out. Uh, love that Leslie was able to get the uh, Kimmy's on film. So mm -hmm. wonderful that you were able to pull all of this together into this story. Uh, love the story. Sound so familiar to my own parents growing up. Some people were identifying with that experience you were sharing. And one that I have to agree with wholeheartedly, the Kim Lu harmonies are fantastic. And they really were in those clips. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think uh, just to start out with a uh, question I was thinking, and I think, Eric, at the end, you were starting to get at some of this, which is, you know, I was just wondering a little bit about... Um, you know, what more can public institutions and cultural institutions do to help make sure that these great Asian and Asian American stories are part of the storytelling that many institutions are doing? And I know, Eric, you do some of that with your nonprofit as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe I could ask both of you, you know, even the film, I think, right, helps to tell that story. What can, what can uh, cultural institutions do uh, along those lines? Eric. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think we can, um, you know, we would love to have, we would love to talk to more institutions. I mean, we have, we talk to a lot of institutions, some of which we uh, we want to work with, um, others are not. I mean, the the project that I'm working uh, doing with the Smithsonian right now is to try to get uh, educational materials for middle and high school. So this, these are essentially lesson plans. They're very, very long and complicated set of lesson plans um, that, um, I mean, if you do everything in the lesson plans, it's, it's going to take a year, um, but people can choose. Uh, but, but the idea is that these, these are really, um, they, they're using music primarily to teach Asian American history and Asian American experience, right? So, so the point is not as much to learn music, although they will hear a lot of music in these lesson plans. Um, it's really a way to get them to learn music and, and each of these lesson plans. I really like the way that it's organized because each set of, which each set, each topic, I guess, uh, in, consists of uh, a lesson for like a history class a lesson for like a language arts class and a lesson for a music class, right? So I think this sort of integrated approach that is able to reach different people, I think would be helpful, right? Uh, in terms of what institutions can do uh, is, is not, so if, if the Rock Hall is interested in doing an Asian American exhibit, I would say, okay, don't just focus on the music, right? Um, the music is obviously important and obviously you're the Rock Hall, um, but, but tell the history of Asian America because people don't know it, right? Yeah. Because you're dealing with a different situation. It's not like, uh, you know, you're, you're making an exhibit on like 1980s rock music and you, people have lived through that period, right? And so the, you, don't, you don't need to give that history because people, your audiences have lived through it or parents of the children who come in have lived through it and then they can tell the stories, right? Uh, but when you're working on Asian American topics, it's really important to give the background. And as I told you, you know, before when we were in the green room, it's like there's a lot more background I'm giving here than I would in a normal AMS paper, right? But because I need to do that because mm -hmm. I cannot expect audience members to know this history. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with, with um, Eric as far as um, Asian American history. It's definitely been erased from you know, whatever, um, whatever we've read. I, I learned a lot just from your speaking about the Kim sisters and, and just the background of, of Asian Americans in America that I didn't know. So I thank you for that, Eric, very much. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that now there are certain cities or even states that are requiring that K through 12, there will be some Asian American history told. History or what we know of what really happened depends on who's telling it. And I think only recently, Asian Americans are beginning to tell their stories, whether it be in documentaries, in narrative films, in books, in, um, in musical programs. Uh, something that you had mentioned as far as 
it's a two-way stream between how we borrow from each other. I believe it's, um, there are many white American, I think women, who have either gone to Bali or gone to Africa and brought back what they've learned and put it into, um, mm -hmm. into musicals on Broadway. That it's, we are, I mean, we are global. And yet the stories being told are sh basically shut off to many people who have very interesting stories to tell and it would affect the way that people uh, regard them for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the stereotypes, we, I grew up with that. You probably grew up with that. The idea that when we start seeing films now, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to see this uh, turning red. There's apparently a lot, it's an animated film for children, but apparently already it's getting the feedback, it's getting, um, some people say it's it's to this, some people say it's to that. It's be, that is a dialogue that I think we need to hear. The idea that I'm saying this, or this is the way I think, and someone says, no, no, this is the way I think. If we can listen to the, to the differences, if we can hear them, um, I think that's important. But it's uh, not as a debate, but the idea of um, calm and alert listening. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really important. But I'm seeing now more films, Minari, Farewell. Um, you know, again, it used to be that my generation, you would just... you turned your head down and you hope that it went away. But now I think this generation, the younger generation of Asian Americans, it's stop AAPI hate. It's, you know, getting out there and saying, we're not going to be quiet anymore. And I think that's that's what you are doing, Eric, you know, as far as um, education and music and putting history in there and uh, uh, socio-political events in there because that's what I think people will resonate with people. Mm -hmm. It really does affect all of us. We're seeing that. We're right. seeing that today. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I can add one more thing, um, I, I think a lot of institutions have this goal of unity. And if your goal is unity, you're not going to hear these stories. So if your goal is unity, don't do it. Do something else. If you really want to tell these stories, you're not going to get unity and that's that's you know, that's fine right that's is, the point is difference and and but is it, yeah. i'm just wondering if for example the difference can be made palatable in some way so that people's ears will open i mean if it's too um i don't know what the word is but that there, there must be a way i mean the way that that the difference between hearing a, uh, a verbal fight and hearing a debate and hearing a conversation, that to set up that kind of dynamic so that people will be able to hear and people will be able to speak without being, si without being silenced or canceled or you know, attacked, you know, because we're seeing that happening now. And so we're closing our ears and eyes to a lot of things. How do you find that that atmosphere, that ambiance, that room, that moderator? I mean, that's, I think, really important. That person who knows how to let someone speak, stop that speaker, uh, change or, or, or um, make a curve in the, in the dialogue rather than a straight line. Um, that's a huge skill. That's, I think that's a huge skill. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how to do it, but, you know, just even to be able to, to discuss it, um, it, would, uh, it would make a huge difference if we can hear each other somehow and just stop before we, re we, before we react, that we are able to respond and that we can res respond in a civilized way, you know, and I don't, as I say, I don't know what that is, but, um, but that's what I'm, I'm hoping for and hoping that there are people who are that diplomatic 
and know how to read crowds and read atmospheres um, that are able to do that. Well, I think it's so important, even just hearing these stories tonight, I know was, uh, even for me, very uh, eye-opening to a lot of the history and things that I didn't know. You know, you listen to the Kim Lu sisters performing in some of the clips we heard, and if you didn't see it, I mean, I think at one point you mentioned they were, uh, was it the Kim Lu sisters or the Kim sisters mentioned as the, had a sound like the Andrew sisters, right? Yeah. Um, and they do. I mean, I don't think you would necessarily identify them as Chinese or Chinese American just by uh, hearing it. Right. But there are things in those performances we can see of this cultural mixing of these different things coming in. And Eric, you mentioned very astutely too, the, the ways in which it both plays with and then works against stereotypes in a number of various mm -hmm. ways. I think that actually um, leads to another great question that came in from uh, someone, Eric, that you know, Mandy Smith, who also works here at the mm -hmm. Rock Hall and is a musicologist. She had a great observation uh, that she put here about uh, the use of percussion and particularly tom-toms and other instruments like that. So I'll read this here. She says, very few women were allowed, let alone encouraged, to play drums of any type on stage mm -hmm. during this time. How do you think their racial and gender identity contributed to their ability to play a male-coded instrument with such success? Was it because they were othered people playing an othered type of drum or a tactic to make them less attractive or sexualized, perhaps both? And I wonder maybe if you could comment on that. It did, you know, even seeing the Kim sisters having a drum set played in one of their mm -hmm. routines. Yeah, um, the Kim sisters' mother, who was also their, their manager, basically, I, I think there are a few things happening. Um, the Kim sisters, when they were starting, they really modeled themselves on the McGuire sisters. That's those were their idols, right? And that that's those were the people they were trying to copy. And as the sixties grew, they saw that uh, there was a change in what types of girl groups were popular. So they're seeing the rise of really black girl groups singing a very different type of music, um, rather than so they were saying, okay. We know that what we were doing is sort of going out. We obviously cannot become a black singing group. Uh, so what can we do to make ourselves do something different? And my understanding is that um, their mother was pushed them to learn all sorts of instruments as much as possible as a way to differentiate themselves, right? So they're not just they, they won't sound old fashioned because they can do these other things. Um, U, UNLV has an archive of their stuff. Um, Sue still lives in Las Vegas. I had meant to go there before, uh, to go work at this archive before this presentation. I haven't had the chance because of the pandemic. Um, so I, I still plan to do that soon. So hopefully I can have a better answer for you. Uh, in a few months or a year or so, but um, but that's that's my current answer. Yeah, fascinating topic, really, when you think about it. Um, I also should say, uh, Leslie, again, the the work you're doing on the film sounds fantastic. Yeah, okay. Maybe you can tell us too. Is there anything that any of our viewers out there tonight uh, can do to help with the film and uh, you know support it in any way? Is there any information about where you're at right now, working on it? Uh, and how they can support it. Well, right now it has been shot. It has been edited by Harry Karamidis. It is now in post-production and it is a um, fiscally sponsored project of NIFA, New, New, uh, New York Foundation for the Arts. There, if you go to my website, www.lesleylee.com, you will see Kim Lu sisters, and then if you hit Kimlu sisters, there's more about them. There's also a donate button. And whatever you care to donate, believe me, we are more than, um, we more than welcome. Uh, whether it's small, whether it's large, it is, um, and it is tax deductible to the, for, to the by law, because uh, New York Foundation for the Arts is a 5013C. And we've gotten uh, certain donations, some of them very generous, but we still have 20 songs that we need to get these songs licenses for. 
we have cleared them. Um, that took quite a while. And we, um, but we have to pay for those songs licenses. I, I thought, you know, they are owned by a number of, I think three major music companies, but we, we were able to clear them for, I think a decent amount of money considering how many songs there are. So that's one of the um, expenses we have along with um, color correction, sound mix. And uh, we've done a Indiegogo campaign um, we have gotten a number of um, grants from different uh, from different institutions, but we are still working on trying to get it finished so we can enter it into film festivals and also find distribution. This is it's the right time. I mean, when I started this film, I was thinking, well, this is a traditional music documentary, but history has pushed it forward so that the thrust is now it's something that um, with the anti-Asian hate uh, and with um, just through the years, the Me Too, the Oscars So White, there it's, it seems to be time, uh, time now that this might be the, the point where it really makes a difference if people um, see films like this, uh, change their minds about uh, or re-evaluate what it means to be American, who is American, what does it take to be American? Because we're at, I think we're kind of at a crossroads in America. And um, um, maybe this is just, you know, it's, it's a way forward to hopefully to seeing a, a better country and a better world. So anyway. Yes, would like thank to, you. I mean, particularly I know that music clearances on films, music films particularly, is one of the hardest things to get done. And yeah. a real challenge to anybody working to do, uh, you know, a video product. Uh, and and you need to see and hear those performances, right? They're crucial to understanding the story, of course. I also want to mention that we do have an ebook that is the companion book to the Kim Lu sisters film. It's called Just Us Girls. It goes for $8.95 um, on Amazon. And all the proceeds, not the profit, the proceeds from the sales of the of that ebook will go towards the finishing funds for the Kim Lu Sisters film. Excellent. Well, again, thank you to both of you tonight. Uh, what a great, fantastic topic. Something, I think, uh, a great way to, to look back at this history and reevaluate. And Eric, to your point earlier about cultural institutions and, and adding it into their lesson plans, I will say, for those out there who have looked at Rockhole EDU, our education platform, we are working on a uh, Asian and Asian American collection in there connected to rock and roll right now. So hopefully that'll be out soon. And Eric, we may uh, tap you to help out a little bit too. Eric That's Hung, good. Leslie Lee, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate thank you. it. Steph. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, uh, Jason. And thank you, John, behind the scenes. Yes. And again, to the American Musicological Society and Steve Swain for introducing tonight. Thank, thank you to everybody out there for watching and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.